Acts chapter number 2. If you're with us for the first time, or the first time in a long time, we're walking through a series, and it's been many weeks now, it's entitled A Biblical Church. And we're returning uh, week after week to the, to the Word of God to see what Jesus Christ desires in the church. Uh, because Jesus is the founder of the church, the church is his body, he's the head. Jesus bought and redeemed the church with his own blood, and uh, the church is his bride. Therefore, the church should reflect what Jesus wants and not what men want. I know that may seem silly, but if we're not careful, we could very quickly allow the mission of the church to change. I don't know if you know this, and it was is interesting to read, but uh, how many of you have ever heard of Avon perfume and makeup and all that kind? Do you know Avon was actually started uh, by a man going door to door selling books? And he gave out perfume as an attraction to, well, to, to lure female customers uh, to, to buy his books. And eventually they didn't want his books, they wanted his perfume. Wrigley Spearmint Gum was actually given out as a bonus uh, along with things like baking soda and something else. And eventually everything that came along with the gum was no longer wanted. The gum became the primary purpose. Even the store, the clothing store, The Gap. The Gap actually was started as a record store where they sold a few pieces of clothing. But before it went bankrupt, they made some marketing changes, and, and The Gap store today is a billion-dollar uh, company selling clothing and no records. See, what we have to be careful of as a church is that we don't lose our mission in pursuit of something else that seems exciting. And that's why we're returning back to what some would call a, well, an outdated book or an obsolete book. But really, the, the Bible is timeless. It's eternal. And as the psalmist said, forever, O Lord, thy words are settled in heaven. And so we're, we're coming back to the Bible because it's very easy for us as men and women who have hearts that are, well, we're not exactly what we ought to be, Right? Very easy for us to be deceived. And so we want to come back to know that we are doing what Jesus has called us to do. And it is a timeless mission. So what is the mission of the church? What is the purpose of the church? And that is why we return and we're trying to seek out the answers to that uh, time and time again as we return to the Bible. And for those of you that have been with us for this length of time, just this will be a... a, a, a this will be just a little bit of a rem reminder, but for the rest of you, just so you know where we're at, we've, we've discussed five characteristics so far of what a biblical church would be out of the scriptures. First is worship. The church exists for God's glory. Everything we do as a body is not about us. It's all about him. And then we looked at, at the word of God. If everything we do is all about him and then he tells us something, he gives us his word, <laughs> we better listen and then obey. And as we do that, we learn to pray. Now, we, we not only receive his words, but we bring our words to him. But, but prayer is not telling God what we want. Prayer is how we approach God so that we can learn his heart. And then we simply ask for what he wants, which is for his glory. To be known across the world, especially in places it's not known yet. He told us in, our, in the model prayer, Jesus, Jesus reminded us about what's next, and that's our biblical community. That we go to God in prayer saying, Our Father, give us our daily bread. And we go on behalf of a biblical community, a group of people that does life together with Jesus Christ as the center. And then we begin to tell people about Jesus. And that's where we've been the last two weeks is on evangelism. Evangelism is the church lovingly proclaiming the truth of Jesus with the prayerful hope that God will complete his work of salvation. We tell the truth, God confirms and draws people 
to himself. And that's where we've been these last couple of weeks as we've returned time and time again to Matthew chapter 16, where, where Jesus looks to his disciples and say, who do people say that I am? And they gave him an answer. And he says, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter can makes this confession. You are the Christ, the son of the living God, to which Jesus answers. And that is the rock. That is the foundation of the church. Which we see so clearly in Acts chapter number 2 as Peter preaches after Jesus' ascension. Peter's going to preach to a gathering of Jews. Many will be saved and they call it Pentecost. The, it starts, I believe, in verse 14, his sermon. But we're going to pick it up as we have a couple of weeks in a row now in verse number 36. Acts chapter number 2, verse number 36, as we see Peter's proclamation of the truth. His evangelism, verse 36. The Bible says this. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself I, I love this just these four verses because Peter proclaims the truth of Jesus and Then you begin to see they're convicted And we see how God draws them to himself and their question is like, well, what do we do now? And Peter says, repent and be baptized. And look at verse 41, if you would. Verse 41. So those who received his word were baptized. And there were added that thousand souls. If Peter preaches, 3,000 people hear him, believe as God does the work to draw them to them, and then they follow that belief with Baptism, which is leading us to the sixth characteristic of a biblical church, and that is the word ordinances. A biblical church will demonstrate, will rehearse, and will celebrate the person and the work of Jesus Christ through baptism and the Lord's Supper. This is what we do as a church. We are commanded as a church, and so if we don't do these, we are not following what Christ wants in his church. So we are commanded to have two ordinances, and let me just explain the difference in case you don't understand. Baptism is an initial act of obedience. Happens, should happen immediately. An initial act of obedience after salvation, and it identifies us with Christ and his body. Lord's Supper... It's a continual act. Like we do it over and over and over. It's not obedience necessarily. It's remembrance of Christ that we participate with ha, each other. His and so for these next two weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to discuss an ordinance and then celebrate one. Today, we're going to talk about baptism. And then we're going to close today celebrating a baptism of our brother tony seal i'm so excited about that but but before we do i want to explain to all of us why does someone get baptized what's the point what's what's the purpose of getting baptized and i just have a couple of words to share with you about why first is the word submission we're baptized as an act of obedience to Jesus. So, so beginning with Peter's response in Matthew 16 of who Jesus is, and all throughout the New Testament, we see Jesus as Lord and Savior, Lord and Savior, Lord and Savior. He's my Savior, right? Because I don't add anything to salvation. I add nothing to salvation. He alone is my Savior, and, and he's my Lord. Meaning I no longer, I recognize I'm no longer my own God. I don't live for myself. I live for Jesus. And so we, we understand he is our Savior and our Lord. And by declaring Jesus as Lord, I acknowledge whatever you want. And so the first reason we get baptized is because Jesus says in the Great Commission, 
Verses that are probably familiar to most Christians, but I'll read it. I'm going to start with the quotation marks. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So if Jesus is my Lord, I will be his disciple by going and making disciples and baptizing them and teaching them. And how am I supposed to encourage people to follow in obedience to a Lord that I won't follow in obedience? There's an implied command for every disciple to be baptized. And the reason I started with submission is this, because baptism is a simple act of obedience. And if a believer who says he's my Lord is not willing to obey this first command, what evidence are you offering that he is your Lord? What evidence is there that you would obey the next command? And so we, we offer the word submission because he, if he is your Lord, you simply obey him. I mean, if we're not willing to get wet, really think about that, we're getting wet. In front of people who love and support us in front of people who will celebrate us getting wet If we're not willing to do that, what makes us think that we'll do something hard? Or when there's opposition One pastor said from the day of Pentecost There is just nowhere in the Bible where we find someone who believes the gospel But refuses to be baptized so we get baptized as submission, or for, for submission. Secondly, we get baptized as an illustration. We are baptized as a picture of the gospel of Jesus. So I think many of you would know who this is, but this was taken on Father's Day, and that's myself and my three children. But here's, I have to make a confession. Those aren't my kids. Those aren't my children. That's just a picture of my children. See, my daughter's not there. She's sitting right there next to my wife. That is a picture. That's all it is. And baptism is nothing more than a picture of salvation. It's not salvation. The Apostle Paul uses the word gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, and the word gospel means good news. And, and, and let's just read a little bit. I have the verses behind me. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Here's what the Apostle Paul says. Because the gospel, again, is the, sorry, baptism is a picture of the gospel. So look at verse 1. He says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. Right, Monica? Being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, unless you believed in vain, verse 3, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Here is the gospel. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And I know some of you are sitting there saying like, Pastor, we know all this. I know it we remember this can we be excited about what the gospel is jesus died and he was buried and he resurrected and i i know some people may say well how is that good news because his it's in his death his burial and his resurrection that we are given a way to the father that there is no other way without his death burial and resurrection and we are restored to a broken relationship from sin with a holy god and we are promised the hope of eternal life a hope where one day, right, Brother Jesse, where, where we're going to stand before God complete and whole, no sickness, for all of eternity, rejoicing in who our Jesus is. Baptism pictures this. As someone is lowered, we're picturing death. As they go under the water, we're picturing burial. And as they come up out of the water, we're picturing resurrection. 
I can show you two short verses where in Colossians chapter 2 it says we've been buried with him in baptism. And in Romans chapter 6 reminds us, the Apostle Paul says this, I'll read these verses. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. He's going to close by saying if we've been united with a death like that, we'll be united in a resurrection like he, like he had. So we are picturing what Jesus did for us when we're baptized. He died for me. He was buried for me, but he rose and he rose so that I would have a new life, a new birth. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, those who are in Christ are new creatures. The old has passed away. All things are become new. What's new? Me. Well, what died? Me. The old me that was bound by sin and controlled by sin was dead and dead buried and then a new me rose and i have a new obedience no longer to sin but to our lord and savior jesus christ so we we see that baptism is excuse me we see it's a submission we see it's ident uh, ident um man i just totally lost my illustration number three sorry that, i guess i have notes for that i should look number three a proclamation we're baptized as a confession of our faith in Jesus. And I'll be a little bit longer on this point, so don't, don't freak out, all right? This one take me a little bit longer. Because I want to make it very crystal clear that baptism plays no part in your salvation. Man, we have to understand this. We are saved by the work of Jesus alone and nothing we do. And that's it's not always crystal clear. The baptism is, not a con baptism is not a condition of salvation. We don't get saved when we get baptized. Baptism is an evidence of salvation. I get baptized because I have been saved. And I'm making a big deal about this because some religions don't teach this. The Catholic Church teaches that infant baptism cleanses babies from original sin. The problem with that teaching is that's not from the Bible. You won't find that anywhere in Scripture. There are other religions that sprinkle babies or baptize children. And I know why these are good-hearted parents who, who really want to believe that this baptism will be a contributing factor to their children's relationship and growth with Christ. And Man, I admire a parent who desires to have their child know Christ and love Christ and follow Christ. But there is, I, I've got to make this clear to you as a church. My job as your pastor. There's nothing in the Bible about anyone being baptized who has not first believed. I, want, I guess I want to, want to make a clear. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 1... He addresses a church where there is great division. And this is what he, he writes to them in a few verses ahead of what we're about to read. He says, I'm actually glad I didn't baptize most of you. Because if I would have baptized most of you, it would have just led for further division. Like, I was baptized by Paul and you weren't. And this is, this is what he says, I'm glad I didn't. And then he goes on to say in verse 17, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And I'm going to pause right there. You know what Paul doesn't say? Christ did not send me to Christ did not send me to preach repentance, but to preach the gospel. Because you can't separate repentance from the gospel. Paul didn't say, I'm not here to proclaim Jesus as Lord, I'm here to preach the gospel. Be because you can't separate Jesus as Lord from the from the gospel. But he does say, I didn't come to baptize you. I came to preach the gospel. And he says that because you can separate the baptism. You can separate baptism from the gospel because the baptism is a picture of the gospel. And I know most of you have heard this illustration, but for those of you who haven't, that's exactly what this wedding ring does. My wife and I got married. It'll be 25 years this October 12th. I hope she's planning something good. Uh... <laughs> I gave her 20 bucks, you know, I, I. 
Do you know that I could, Sam, can you catch? Don't miss. I can, I can toss Sam that wedding ring, put it on your finger, but don't let it get stuck because I want it back, all right? Sam, are you married? You got a wedding ring on right now? Oh, this, he's got a wedding ring on, but you're, you're not married? No. Am I married? <laughs> yes. Do I have a wedding ring on? No. And does that make me not married? Nope. Does putting a ring on make him married? Nope. There are people who get baptized believing that baptism helps them get saved. You can be baptized all day long. It doesn't mean that you're saved. And the beauty of Jesus is that he does all the work for us. And so I can actually be saved without being baptized. The wedding ring is a beautiful illustration of understanding. You could take it off. It doesn't change anything. You could put on, so why do I get baptized? Why? Why do I wear a wedding ring? I wear a wedding ring because I want everyone around to know me that my heart has been given. Like, I'm committed. There's someone who I am promised to. It's why sometimes you see in TV movies, TVs or movies, you see, you see a guy go into a bar and he pulls his wedding ring off when he sees a pretty girl. He puts it in his pocket because he doesn't want her to know he's committed. And I hope none of you do that, but, but that's, that, that's the whole point. He's already committed, but he takes his ring off because he doesn't want this woman to know he is committed. We get baptized because I want all of you and the world to know I am committed to Jesus because he's committed to me. Man, it's important that we don't build our beliefs on, well, I get baptized in order to. No, no, I I'm going to read a few verses, and this is going to take me just a few moments to get through, but I want to just make it crystal clear again in your mind. You will never find anywhere in the scriptures where someone is baptized without first Believing and no, Sam, I haven't forgotten about my ring. All right, Acts chapter 2, verse 41. They received his word, then they were baptized. Acts chapter 8, when they believed Philip, they were baptized. Acts 8 13, Simon himself believed and after being baptized. Acts 8 37 and 38, if you believe and he baptized him. Acts chapter 9, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you and you were filled with the Holy Spirit. Then he rose and was baptized. Acts chapter 10, who have received the Holy Spirit, commanded them to be baptized. Acts chapter 16, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul and after she was baptized. Verse 31 of Acts 16, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And then he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Chapter 18, they believed in the Lord together with his entire household. They believed and were baptized in ch verse nine, chapter 19 of Acts. On hearing this, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. I took the time to go through that because I need you to understand that baptism always takes place after believing, never before. But I know that's going to lead to a question. Well, I was baptized as a baby before I believed in Jesus. What do I do? We close here with Acts chapter 19 because that's exactly what took place right here. Paul met some disciples of Jesus and he said, do you have the Holy Spirit in this little conversation right here? And they said, we don't understand. We don't know who the Holy Spirit is. And he said, well, tell me about your baptism. And they said, we were baptized by John the Baptist. And this is Paul's answer. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance. Understand this. John the Baptist was baptizing people before Jesus went to the cross. No one understood who Jesus was, who, what Jesus was going to do. Paul, uh, John was baptizing people who knew they needed to repent of their sins. This group of people had heard the truth about Jesus. They believed in Jesus, and they said, we've already been baptized by John. And Paul said, you need to be baptized now that you know the truth in the name of the Lord Jesus. So I would just tell you, Scripture just simply doesn't leave room for someone to remain unbaptized after they believe in Jesus. But let me briefly talk about rebaptism. Because it, it's fairly prevalent in some churches to rebaptize people. 
if they make a life change, if they have gone out into sin and they, they want to return and they repent, or sometimes with the desire to recommit their life to Jesus. And I think those are incredible, such wonderful decisions, and I applaud them. But let me just kindly and gracefully say this. None of those decisions are related to baptism. Baptism serves one purpose. I am professing my faith in the work of Jesus Christ. Period. Baptism is not, we're not commanded to get back into the water after we repent. We're not commanded to get back into the water once we grow in our faith. But I understand why people sometimes get rebaptized, and, and here's the reason: because we love the feeling that an experience provides, especially when it comes to religion. There's something in us that it just seems that the better, better our experience, well, then the more genuine the moment is. Not just in baptism. I mean, have you ever left the church service and said, man, wasn't the worship good? What did you mean by the worship was good? It means you were moved. Man, that, that song got to me. It, it hit my heart. I started to cry. I raised my hand. The worship was good. Let's, let's remember, what's the purpose of worship? Not about us. The purpose of worship, it doesn't matter if I'm moved. It matters if he receives our worship rightly because our worship is only for God. And so Aaron, come up here and lead us in a great worship song. It's not about Aaron and it's not about how you feel. It's about that worship going to God. And baptism is not about how it makes me feel. I know of a young man in the church where I used to serve. He was baptized five times in two years. Good kid, great kid, had an incredible heart. Here's why he kept getting baptized. I don't feel saved. I, I get baptized and I feel really good for a little while, and then I don't feel good, and, and now I, I want to get baptized again. And then he, 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 five times in two years. But here's the thing. If we want an experience, we need to experience Jesus. Because Jesus took our experience for us. He took what we should have faced. Death, separation from God, eternal hell for the wrath against our sin. Jesus experienced that. So what do I need to experience? Jesus. Yeah. Now, is it wrong if someone gets rebaptized? I'm not calling that a sin. I don't, please don't, don't misinterpret that at all. I'm, I'm thrilled when people want to express a desire to follow Jesus. But what we have to understand is the purpose behind baptism is simple. It is a display not of our faith, but of his faithfulness to us. It's not about how well I'm following him. It's about how much he laid down to make me his own that's profession proclamation shortly just just two left identification we're baptized sorry we're baptized to follow the example of jesus so we get baptized in water not sprinkled because jesus was baptized in water he came up out of the jordan the bible says the word bat the word baptized in the new testament means to immerse and what i find interesting about jesus's baptism which we'll which we'll read in just a few moments is that that when jesus went to be baptized john was baptizing for the repentance of sins but jesus had no sin why does jesus get baptized matthew chapter 3 tells us about it it says, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now. For thus it is fitting for us to, notice these words, fulfill all righteousness. Let me pause and talk about that for just a moment. Jesus was identifying with sinners in this moment to fulfill all righteousness. One day, and I, I, I'll be brief here, one day we will stand before God, and we will stand before God if we have believed and trusted in Jesus with his robes of righteousness over our shoulders, right? 
You know what we won't be doing is we won't be standing with Jesus's robes of righteousness over us holding a few good things we did. You know the good things we do? You know what they're called in Isaiah? Filthy rags, right? So we're not going to be ro- we're not going to be holding Jesus's great beautiful robes of righteousness and saying, "And look what I did too." That's not what we're going to be doing. Did Jesus understand this? He had to then in his life, he had to complete every command and desire and will of the father in order for us to be clothed perfectly in his righteousness he was baptized because it is a command of god to be baptized so he was baptized on our behalf so when he drapes that robe of righteousness over me he it's him and him alone he got baptized for you he was identifying with sinners but the beauty goes on it says in and Jesus, when he was, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. I absolutely love this. You understand, Jesus is identifying with sinners when he goes to be baptized, and when he comes up out of the waters, the holy, perfect God and the Holy Spirit come down, and we see the Trinity on display as Jesus identifies with men and sinners. God and the Holy Spirit, the Father and the Holy Spirit, they identify with Jesus as the Holy Spirit descends like a dove. And the Father says, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. Well pleased. He's identifying with us. That's what moves the Father. Woo! How special are you? I've never heard a dove. No, sorry. Never, seen, never heard a voice and never seen a dove at baptism. But Tony, here's what I'm going to tell you. When you get baptized today, you will have a father who is going to be splitting the heavens open. He is looking down and saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You won't hear it. We won't see it, most likely. If we do, I might be running. All right. (laughs) I'm not sure about that one. But we know that's what's taking place. Finally and last, the word participation. We're baptized because we're obeying Christ. We're picturing Christ. We're proclaiming Christ. We're illustrating Christ. Or we're following the example. And now we're participating. We're uniting with the church of Jesus. I love baptisms because it reminds me of those times when, when a new baby comes to church. New baby comes to church. And they're like, oh, let me see the baby. Let me hold the baby. Oh, this is such a cute little baby. Poke the cheeks. And I, I remember when our children were born, they were, we, we called our families and told them. And everyone was so excited. Why? Because a new member was being brought into the family. And that's what baptism is. is it, it's going to show us that someone's coming in to unite with the family. And unite in a way that's going to break down barriers. It's Galatians chapter 3. Here's what Paul says. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, put on Christ. Now here's what he says. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, nor male or female. You are all one. That means we are all, we're one family. There is no racial divide. There's no gender. There's not, nothing matters except that we are in Christ. Ephesians 4 shows us the unity of baptism as well within the church. There's one body and one spirit, just as you are called to the one hope that belongs to your call. Get this. One Lord. This, is, this shows you how important baptism is. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. You see how baptism is put right in there? That's how important it is. But what does it begin with? There's one body. Baptism identifies us with that body or that body finally first corinthians 12 the paul paul said this for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body this is why you can't sit in a bathtub hold your nose and go backwards because when you get baptized you're baptized into something and that's why you want to have that body that you're baptized into be present when you're baptized because they're going to watch you get baptized and they're going to cheer and celebrate. That's one of ours. Yeah. Welcome to the family. We're so thankful. There's, there's no secret Christians. You can't be a Christian in secret. 
You have to, as a pattern of biblical confession, tell of what you've done. Proclaim it through baptism of what you've done, and then you become a part of that community, that community that gathers together for the glory of God who worships and prays together, opens the word and encourages one another, and then remembers and celebrates the work of Christ together. And so today, we're going to remember the work of Christ through an individual displaying his profession in Christ. And then next week, when you come back, we're going to remember the work of Christ again, but we're going to do it corporately. As we take the Lord's Supper together and remember the work and the person of Christ. And so, so the whole message, if, if you've ne not, never been baptized after believing in Jesus, you need to. If you have been baptized, may I encourage you, when Tony gets in this water... Would you go back to your baptism and would you just remember it? And would you remind yourself, I was picturing what Jesus did for me when he died and was buried and rose again. And, and, and whenever you see or hear of someone being baptized, rejoice with them and welcome and celebrate them. So in just a moment, we're going to... We're going to stand to sing a song so that Tony and I can go get ready. In fact, Tony, I'll go ahead and dismiss you if you want to go ahead and, and get ready. I'll, I'll be in there in just a moment. But, but here's the thing. When we stand to sing just a song so we can get prepared, if you've never been baptized and you're like, I heard it, I think I want to do it right now, we have a way for you to. Now, what I would love to do is I'd love to have you be baptized when you have friends and family gathering around so they could see your proclamation but if you feel like hey you know what i need to get baptized right now pastor mike's going to be at the back door and if you would just let pastor mike know we'd love to have a short conversation with you to make sure you fully understand this because what i don't want to do is i don't want to send you into the baptistry waters without understanding why but also if you say like i've got a child that hasn't been baptized yet and they know what they're doing or I've never been baptized after believing in Jesus, you let Pastor Mike know while, while we're getting ready, and we would love to prepare your, you and or your family for a time of baptism as we celebrate the work of Jesus. I can't wait, Kim, to hear this testimony that you're going to share with us about Tony. And we as a church, man, this is, this is a blessed day when we get to see a brother coming to Jesus and professing that publicly for all of us would you pray with me father i ask that in this time that we as a church we would we would celebrate your work oh, I, I don't want anybody's heart to be moved to to what do i have to do next push that out and like let's celebrate what you have done for us eternally and God, I pray that our hearts would exalt you, would magnify you, would glorify you and the work that you are doing. And Lord, if there's anybody here that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, if there's, ever, if there's anything that they have trusted in other than your work alone, I pray that today would be a day where they could cement that in their own heart and in their own life. Father, if there's anybody here who you are convicting right now, that needs, needs to follow you in believer's baptism. Lord, I pray that you would, would give them the courage that they need to remind them your courage took you to the cross. We just need to get in a tank of water. But may we do it understanding the great purpose behind it, the exaltation, the proclamation, the illustration of the great good news of the gospel that Jesus died and was buried and rose again for me. Amen and amen. Would you stand with me?
Kim, who is Tony's wife, is going to uh, read his testimony, and uh, his family's here as well. Dante, would you stand up? And these are Kim. Why don't you introduce all the family? Actually, everyone that, that you have that is here uh, with you. Sorry, Dante, I didn't mean to make you stand up all by yourself. This is Tony's son back from. Did you say Korea? Yeah, back from Korea. Yeah. So, man, what a wonderful. Yeah. Um, Thank you for serving our country. Yeah. Why don't Why don't you have everyone stand up, Kim? There you go. This is Cameron. Um, we have my sister, Kelly. This is the testimony of Tony Seal. Did y'all get that? Um, the Tony many of you know and love, and even more of you have prayed for. I'm going to share his testimony, but really, this is a reminder of God's love and faithfulness. It is, a rem it is a reminder of how even when we're not looking, he is always pursuing us. He will truly leave the 99 to, find the, to go after the one that is lost. Tony grew up in a Christian home. 
he is kin to many of you sitting here today. When Tony was six, his brother, his little brother, was tragically taken to be with the Lord. This was an almost impossible reality for Tony to accept. He wondered how a loving God could, be take, could take away his little brother. Tony ran from God and anything to do with church. When I accept Jesus as my Savior, it got harder for Tony to ignore that his Heavenly Father loved him. Seeing the work of the Lord in my life and in the lives of our children became impossible for him to ignore. Plus, he had hundreds of you guys praying for him. <laughs> Bet you didn't know that one. <laughs> Around Easter, God began to soften Tony's heart. He started sharing things with me that he'd never even been opening to mentioning. He asked a lot of hard questions and shared many uncertainties. When I couldn't answer some of his questions or relieve some of his concerns, I asked if he would meet with Pastor Brian. I almost fell out of my chair at Rancho's when he agreed and said yes. I immediately texted my prayer warriors and asked for them to pray. During that meeting, Tony shared his concerns with Pastor Brian. He realized he didn't have to be perfect or have it all together. He began to understand that God loves him no matter what and that Jesus came to die for his sins. All of them, past, present, and future. Since that day, Tony has begun to live in the forgiveness and grace of the Lord. He has become more patient and understanding. He sees the work of the Lord in people and in the world. He even told me that on the day of his salvation, God painted a double rainbow in the sky. He and I both know that Tony's salvation is truly a God of the impossible miracle. We also both know that salvation does not equal perfection and that we will both make mistakes together and as individuals. But we also both agree that we want to raise our kids to know, love, to know and love Jesus, and that is the most wonderful feeling a wife could ever have. Tony, excuse me, I'm going to ask you three questions. And it was, it was a beautiful conversation uh, that uh, we had at, at Rancho's together. And, uh, man, this guy asks some really good questions, but we have a God that has all the answers. And it was wonderful. So, Tony, uh, do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross to save sinners? And have you personally placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And is it your desire to follow Jesus with your life? In that profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, Tony Seal, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. <laughs> Amen and amen. That is a way to end a church service, isn't it? Man, that is all about God's glory. We're so thankful uh, that you were here today. Pastor Mike, would you mind making your way up here and uh, closing us off in, in prayer? And again, if any of you uh, believe that you need to, in obedience and submission, uh, follow Jesus in baptism. You talk to any of the pastors, you talk to one of the deacons, uh, we will do everything we can to try to